I'm Inger, and I have with me Elmo, and this is Brutally Honest Talk Radio. Welcome to Brutally Honest Talk Radio, where you will learn about an issue minus the BS. We don't always say what you want to hear, but what you need to hear about the issues of the day. Here's your host, Inger, along with Elmo, with his political insight and commentary. How are you doing, Elmo? I'm doing muy bien. Thank you for asking, Inger. How are you doing today? Doing, could be better. <laughs> doing okay. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> it could be better, but it's okay. It'll be okay. Yeah. One, one good thing about days is they got to come to an end. You know, you're going to be able to get a fresh day and, and reboot. That's very true. An opportunity to start over and, and, and do better each day. It is five days after the election began, <laughs> five days after it started. And then today I saw a message saying that Biden is officially president-elect. And I had a video with Gayle King discussing with a couple other people that they finished counting votes or counted some more votes that put him up into uh, 290 electoral vote range. Okay. So uh, yesterday, it still wasn't official and nothing had been decided yet. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I'll start and, and get it out of the way. And, make, and that way, I don't have to worry about saying it later, is I was wrong about several things. One thing is I thought Biden wasn't going to win more than 12, 15 states. I expected him to get California. Mm -hmm. And uh, for Trump to get Texas, and that happened. And then uh, the, the battleground states were key. So I, I saw this interview yesterday, and it was a conversation with, with a few people. One of them was Kyle Kalinske, okay. and he is a, a, an expert on how, uh, how things work in politics and the news and, and with the government. So he was, he was talking, and uh, the video is actually from Election Day. He said, he said then, he said, whoever gets Pennsylvania is going to be the winner, mm -hmm. you know. And um, he said he really didn't like either one of them or, you know, wasn't leaning more to one than the other. Uh, just saying uh, it was interesting. Like he, he knew the math. He knew the pattern. He said mail in ballots. Those are the, the people that mailed in or did the early voting or the people that voted for Biden. Most of the people who went to the polls on November 3rd were voting for Trump. Mm -hmm. So depending on the state that you're talking about, it started off with Biden leading or started off with Trump leading, but then could flip mm -hmm. Then could flip later. I mean, look what happened in Georgia. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, November 3rd, Atlanta was a blue dot and most of the rest of the state was red. This was this was like nine ten o'clock, <laughs> you know, nine yeah. ten p.m. on the third. Anyway, things turned around, and they said, "Well, they're they're counting more votes and more votes, and now uh, uh, Trump has a thousand vote lead and a six hundred vote lead, and then four hundred. And I'm thinking to myself, what if they're counting? If they're counting votes, there's got to be some coming from both sides. Mm -hmm. It's not like you're in a race and somebody's gaining on you. So you stop running. You just stop. I mean, you're moving too. Mm -hmm. And then the rate of who is taking the lead, that can change. And then Trump did, he did win Florida, right? right. I mean, that never, that never changed. That, that never flipped. Let's say 60% of eligible voters voted and then somebody got 265 and then they they counted they counted a whole lot more votes and I, I guess I'm saying I thought that th there's only one th there's only one person in a game of cards that can hold the ace of spades there's not two aces of spades right and the first one who gets it or gets to it has it so mm -hmm. you know he's obviously reached a number that has surpassed 270 so all these votes that have not been counted yet. They're just null and void. 
even even if hypothetically they were for Trump, mm -hmm. right? So that that doesn't that doesn't matter. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I guess the electoral college. You know, I was always thinking over the years. After a certain amount of time, after the polls close, they gotta call it. They gotta say, okay, oh, you know, whatever constitutes one electoral vote, say this this county or this state, it it is one. Yeah, for this, um, you said one thing definitely in amongst other things, but calling it. My issue is the press does not tell us who the president is. They merely report on what they think they have at that point. From what I understand from the electoral, from the election and the electoral college and that process is that first the electoral, the elections directors, they must certify the election results. So what they do in that process, I'm not sure exactly what that is, but um, if, it, if it had been a normal election, whatever that looks like at this point in time, if it had been a normal election, they would get the results, they would certify the results, and then I'm assuming send it up to the Secretary of State or wherever it goes, and then the electors would then stand or do whatever it is that they do to say, yes, these elect the elector says this state is going to this particular candidate. And from what I understand that timeline, that doesn't happen until December. So, oh. yeah. And so from, let's say we kind of been through this in 2000, I think, with the Gore-Bush thing. So 2000, Gore-Bush, uh, um, Gore -Bush, they had the election. There was the thing about the hanging chads. Gore requested to have the recount for m not the whole state of Florida, definitely. I think it was maybe maybe one or two counties or something like that, or maybe even one county. So they go through, they recount, they do the hanging chads, blah, blah, blah. That whole process took 37 days. So let's imagine from November 3rd all the way to, what is it, December 3rd, maybe even all the way to December 10th that that whole process was going through. So from what I understand, let me back up just a minute, from what I understand, then electors don't get together before December 16th or mid-December sometime to stand up and say, yes, this is where these, this is where the electors go, that sort of thing. So to have the press sit back and say, this is what's going on and this is what's happening, and now the press <laughs> is calling who the president is, that's nowhere in the constitution. Look. So it sounds like I need to smack Gail King with a fish. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> reporting <laughs> a dead reporting fish. that news. Hey, exactly. hey, Gail, turn, turn your face. Let me get your good side. Okay, <laughs> ready, set. It's yeah. Smacked. Um. So yeah, you're talking about the official official uh, declaration of who is the you know who is going to be the president, and then of course with Gore and Bush. Uh, there was a debacle in Florida, mm -hmm. and neither one of them, I understand, had had to uh, had 270. You know, by the end of election day, and they they already knew then that there was a problem with Florida, so mm -hmm. they they kept on kept on counting votes, and then uh, I think you're referring to them when you say in uh, December uh, or or you know weeks later that they. They finally, they got enough votes to accumulate electoral votes, and then uh, Bush took it. Or they had enough um, evidence, because mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, I can't remember the attorney general's name, but it went to a Florida court, and the courts had to get involved in the Bush-Gore thing. And then right. it was all fine. Yeah, and then was all finally said and done then it's like, okay, this is where we stand. I think it was like 500 votes or something for that particular um, county or state or whatever, but it was 500 votes. And then by then we, we saying, okay, here we go. Here's where we are. I have, you know, these are the electors. This is how they're going to do this and that sort of thing. And I'm assuming that they wait until mid-December 
just to give all the states a chance to do what they need to do to get the certification in and to, you know, get all the processes going and give them plenty of time to get that process completed before the actual electors for each state um, either come together or do what it is they do in their respective states. No wonder the inauguration isn't scheduled until January 20th. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly. They need so much time to to uh, get through all of this, especially, I don't know if it was like this 100 years ago, but you had information and communication which traveled much slower than uh, than it does today. Right. And, um, and really, it doesn't make sense. What I think we've done is we have kind of um, taken it that the press is <laughs> telling us the truth when these things yeah. happen. But now you have half of the population, literally half of the voting population, who have been told that Trump is evil, he doesn't, he's wrong, he doesn't do anything right, the media doesn't report on anything good he does. So you have one half of the population that thinks he is the devil incarnate, and you have the other population, set of the other half of the population, who doesn't watch that mainstream media piece. They're watching these other media outlets to give them more balanced news. And, um, and you have this other half that are going, no, that's not right. We're not going to take what that, what that first half says, because we know for the last four years that they've been lying. So it's like where we used to be able to trust the media and the media would say, yes, this is the case and it would go forward. Now we literally have half of the population that doesn't trust the media and half the population that does. So I think with all this going on, it needs to, it needs to go to the courts. And we as a culture need to switch how we take these things in. Should we let the media call it anymore going forward? No, we should not. I think we need to wait. And maybe it's good for us to wait a month, a month and a half to get the results. Because then maybe by then we know they're accurate, they're fair. All the processes, processes have been followed and done to get to the correct outcome. And everybody's vote has been counted. So, It yeah. would be cool if the Electoral College had a website and they could officially put a seal of approval out there. Um, where they they are the bottom line source, and no one else can say it until they say it first. And then, if they were to stream live on their site, the the announcement of who it is, you know, like someone someone uh, you know coming out live making making an official statement. Yeah, that would that would not be bad at all. I wouldn't have an issue. If that that you said was even available on C-SPAN, because C-SPAN sure. they can offer commentary, they just put it out there. It's the raw data, so I would that would be a wonderful idea. Also, I have an issue with the Secretary of State sites, Secretaries of State sites saying 100% of the precincts are in, 100% of the votes are counted, but then. Each day you're getting a trickle in. Oh, we got 10,000 votes left to count. Oh, we got 25. Oh, we have 50. Well, then 100% of the votes aren't in. Right. So then what they need to tell, they need to break down that actual vote. These are the absentee votes. These are the in-person votes. These are the mail-in votes, that sort of thing. Give me some denominator that I can work with. So when you say, so I can trust that when you say 100% is in, then 100% is in and we're done and we're working with this with this numerator with this batch of votes here and that's it. So um yeah, that's something's something's got to give. And and thankfully this process has worked up until now, but now we're seeing where there are issues. You know, any quality control process improvement person which I used to be can see where the um where the process has broken down. And all this is, is just showing us where our processes need to be fixed. That's what this is showing. I'm reading on Twitter a few uh, tweets from the last 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And uh, this woman is talking about, you know, the preposterous calculation and totals of the votes. So here's a few statements she made. 4 a.m., Dump Wisconsin, 65,000 votes, 100% for Biden. 
4 a.m. dump. Michigan, 138,000, 100% for Biden. Arizona <laughs> poll workers forcing voters to use Sharpies, thereby invalidated ballots. Trump leading in Georgia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, and they stopped counting before the boat ferry visits overnight. <laughs> 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 um yeah and you know how twitter can be so there's a lot of people that are not happy uh this woman melissa tate this is travesty but we caught them this election is just beginning and i've, I've heard uh since a few days ago people on both sides saying that there's a uh, voter fraud involved and we we can jump into that in a minute first i just want to say i don't know if you caught this this was on election day this was on november 3rd and this was like maybe six seven o'clock that evening showed uh i think this was just in georgia they showed mail-in votes in these crates that are like 18 inches by two feet wide okay. all right like a rubber made plastic crate that you would get at uh walmart or home depot filled with votes they're on a pallet and the pallet is like seven or eight feet high. And on this one pallet, they said was 55,000 votes what? that they hadn't started. They hadn't started counting before Election Day. <laughs> this is just one pallet in, in one state. So it's like, God, you know, listen, we, we don't believe in Santa Claus. If you want to if you want to start a little early, I mean, we know Santa has to go all the way around the world. I mean, you don't have to surprise us. Or if you do surprise us, just start a little early. They should have started counting these votes before Halloween if they had that many mailed in. Now, you can have a cutoff date. Well, let's see. And, and they do. The cutoff date, I would think, would be, well, they, and that was an issue of contention as well. Yeah, like a postmark, you know, so that... um well, well, no. Let, let's say let's say some people mail in their vote October first. Some mail it in October twenty first. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're if you're counting for a week before the election, then by the time November third gets here, then you're just counting the the tail end of it. But you don't have to start from the beginning. Like, we don't need to make this a ritual. You know, <laughs> it's okay. Just keep it official. You can get five guys standing there as witnesses, one watching the other, and he's watch somebody else to make sure everything is cool. And then there's there's no way, there's no way that uh, all of the how many people would would it take just to go through that one pallet? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, but but so. that's part of the issue as well because I think for maybe. I don't know. Oh, maybe I don't know if it's Georgia or not, but there are some states, and I want to say Pennsylvania is one, where you're not allowed to start counting the votes until the polls are closed. In other wow. states, I think you're allowed to count the votes maybe that same day, the ones that you have, you know, absentee or whatever. You can start counting them that day as election day is, and then other other places, I don't think you can. Again, this is there's no standard, so kind of everybody is doing their own thing, which I think is creating part of part, which is creating an issue. Yeah, it's 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 so sketchy. I mean, I, I'm the kind of person I would say with this, and when it comes to a lot of things, either I trust the system or I don't. Mm -hmm. I think that if someone votes, they should trust the system at least up until the time they vote. There's something different or unprecedented happens in the election that would make you question it. But if you've been voting for years, I, I don't want to, every time the guy I vote for doesn't win, say, well, I don't trust the system. Because the, the same, I assume that the vast majority of the people in the electoral college now and the volunteers and people counting the votes, that most of them, were there when Obama got elected and reelected. And of course, he is very different from uh, Trump. And, you know, Biden is a different kind of candidate also. Mm -hmm. So I either want to trust it or not trust it. And, mm -hmm. you know, the burden of proof is on them. So what I'm saying is, 
I, I will trust it until I have good reason to believe that it can't be. Now, it, it's not a uh, it's not an inhuman system or a humanless system that's all digital and automated. It's not. There's uh, there's thousands of people that are involved in helping out at the polls and maybe in the um, the adding up and the bringing together of all the votes. And I'm sure that all, all these volunteers and all these people that are helping count the votes and people that work for the Electoral College, they vote too. Mm-hmm. They vote too. So it's not like being a journalist where you can do that and, and not care. And you you only have control over your own vote. You know, one man or one woman, one vote. But, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. See, in a state like California, you don't have to have voter fraud because m- most of the people that are volunteering or working in the in the ballot counting process or working in the system, they're probably liberal and voting uh, Democrat anyway. Like you, you don't you don't have to have it. There are people in California who vote Republican. But. If the if the Republican volunteers in California cheated, I don't even think that would help or make a difference because it's so one sided. You know what I mean? Yeah, but at the same time, for this, I don't think this is now. Out in the interest of full disclosure, of course, I want President Trump to have a second term. At the same yeah. time, this particular issue is not a partisan issue. It is it's nonpartisan. Because regardless of who wins, I would think, one, that that person wants to win fair and square, and two, that that person wants this process to be clean, so there there is no doubt, one, that they won, and two, that we can trust the process. That's the thing. If we can clean up this process, either side, regardless of who wins, we can clean it up, then we know that everyone's right in vote yeah. has been accurately counted, and it does actual count, actually count. That's that's a good point in that what when you're saying that it makes me think about the fact that it's it's important for the American people to trust the integrity of the vote and the system. Yes. It's it's important for that. Yes. And if, yeah. if, if this is what it takes to do that, then let's do it. Right, right, right. There were two things. For four years they did not let this man do what he needed to do. They were they tried to impeach him on January 19th before he even got in there. They were talking about impeachment. So he hasn't been. Yeah. He, you know, he wasn't left alone to do what he needs to do. Um, I I don't see them actually, you know, the, let's put it this way. The press will let it go. The press will not question them on anything. They're not going to hit hard on anything. They've already, they already haven't hit hard on anything. So they're not going to question them. They're not going to push them. And I think I'm of the second mind that we really need to, we, need, we really need to fight this and we really need to lay it on the table. And if people are not doing what they are supposed to be doing, especially when it comes to this, then they need to be punished. That's it. Because the only way that you will stop this is if you punish the people who are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And that's from the person who sends in a ballot that doesn't belong to them, is not rightfully theirs, and they took someone else's and voted on someone else's behalf, all the way up to elections directors and that sort of thing that aren't doing what they're supposed to do. You know, I am totally okay with that in in between. Um, And also, in 2016, from what I understand, we knew who the president was at 3 a.m. on Wednesday morning. Yeah. So why is there such an issue now? I mean, 3 a.m. on Wednesday morning, we knew who the president was. I think because of the I think. Well, one thing, one thing is the volume of votes. This is a record of the number of people that uh, that have ever voted. Mm -hmm. And we know that if it if it never hit 62 percent before, there was a lot of room for growth and a lot of room to break records as far as turnout. So, um, and then the combination of standing in line on election day, early voting and mail-in votes, 
the combination of all of that with votes arriving from different sources at different times on different days and someone somehow having to organize that and make sense of it. Mm-hmm. So, um, I know you want to talk about it. Yeah, why is why are we not knowing now and why are we hearing uh, different things several days later? There, there may be multiple reasons, multiple reasons for that. And uh, any, anything that's wrong, I want it to be called out and uh, stopped if it's, uh, if it's incorrect and unjust. Mm-hmm. I, I guess what I'm saying is uh, Donald Trump is a person that is you know, let somebody else do that fight and push for it people that are in those positions that know how to uh investigate and they have information and they can they can measure and share and compile and put that together there there are people uh the people that work in this process there are people that work in uh office and politics that can do that um I don't know. I, I kind of always, always felt like with the results of an election, either the person I want to get in there is going to get in there or the, um, the, <laughs> the other person is going to catch the, um, catch the arduous task of being commander in chief. And some people may get in there that aren't fit to be president. And then they they hang themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I just know some of these things they can take a very long time before it comes to a head. And just like I said, for for Trump as a as a person, uh, because with the impeachment, which was which was totally wrong, uh, b- because um, Congress came to him and asked him to see some paperwork. And he said, no, I'm not going to show it to you. Get a subpoena. That's obstruction of, of Congress. <laughs> right. We know they changed the articles a couple of times. You know, first was bribery, although nobody offered him any money. How, right. how, can, you, how can you bribe Donald Trump? Don't you have to have a, a trillion dollars in cash in 20s <laughs> and non-sequential bills? Right. Now, you gonna how are you going to bribe Trump? What can you, how can you, what can you offer a man that has everything? Right. You know what I mean? Exactly. How are you going to bribe a man who's been giving away his, his salary since he started? <laughs> but you're going to bribe him. Okay. <laughs> are you going to offer to put platinum toilets on his plane instead of gold toilets? <laughs> you know, I don't know if people know this. I mean, Donald Trump, before he became president, he had a plane that made Air Force One look like a Cessna. <laughs> I'm talking about he downgraded. They said that the that the toilets and the sinks in his plane were made of gold. I'm talking about solid gold. Mm-hmm. None of this hollow stuff, you know, <laughs> the kind of can where you, you feel bad just to sit on it. Like <laughs> this 14 carat. I don't want to I don't want to blow this up. But anyway, I'm just saying. Um, and then, you know, he has he has his businesses. Um I don't know if they can fully recover in a, in the next several years, you know, from the smearing of the brand and, you know, hatred, hatred doesn't have any boundaries. So the, the people that the media and the Democrats got to hate Trump because of the kind of president that they said he was the kind of person who he was that crossed the lines of politics in the business. And a lot of people, I'm sure decided to not do business with him anymore or to not uh, patronize his businesses, you know, just believe in, believe in the hype, believe in un, um, unsubstantiated claims about him, whether it's being racist or whatever, you know? Yeah. And um, I think after all this, whichever way it goes, if he serves a second term or if he's done, he's not going away. The, the larger question yes. is what is going to happen to the Republican brand, the Republican yeah. Party? Because now you have a, a person who didn't necessarily identify as a Republican, but he ran under the Republican ticket. He uh, did those things, those conservative things that Republicans say they like to do. And now the electorate has 
high expectations. So the Republican brand will not be able to go back to, well, we're happy warriors, but we keep losing. Folks are, aren't going to be happy with that. So I think his, if Trump doesn't win or he does win, either in four years or in eight years, the he's going to take the Republican brand with him. He's, he's transformed it. I don't know. Will it be the Trump party, the Democrat party, and the Republican party? I don't know. But there's going to be a change in the Republican brand. Don't know you know, but before the election, I was thinking that Trump has changed the Republican party permanently. And people are going to come out inside out with their personalities and be fearless and kind of follow his model in the way that he did now um you know they they um it's a two-sided coin with one side of it being wow look at all that trump has accomplished all that he has done and this guy called into uh red eye radio and he said he was 70 years old and he's he said that he thought that trump was the best president that he's seen in his lifetime mm -hmm. And it's clearly, you know, there's there's a long list of things that he's done. And then some of the Republican Party, they may look at it and go, oh, well, because of things that he said or because of how he acted or people thought he was rude or whatever, whatever it is, you know, uh, being brash about his personality that people didn't like, that may have hurt him or mm -hmm. it, it may be different. I mean... I don't know. Uh, the The media has been has been attacking Republicans for a very long time. It's just never been this intense. <laughs> it's yeah. all out war uh, against a person. But I, I did want to say that when when you said Trump is not going away, that's exactly what I've been thinking over the last few days. Mm -hmm. So let's let's take this scenario. Let's say that without a doubt. Everybody, every reasonable person looked at whatever results, let's say everything was in, all the votes were counted on November 3rd, and that Biden clearly won, or he won like, you know, 80% of the country or whatever. Mm -hmm. Trump is such a strong personality, he can't go away. Right. He can't. Uh, the country has known him for decades, right. literally, and he's, he's a charismatic guy. If Trump didn't have charisma, they wouldn't have approached him and asked him to do the apprentice. Right. right. So what whatever happens, I think I think that if if in the most civil way that Trump and the presidency went their separate ways and Trump went back to living his life, working his businesses or whatever, that the media would start checking in with him again putting a microphone and a camera in his face, asking his opinion about everything mm -hmm. because his answers are charismatic and funny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, he, he had a, he had a nickname for everybody, everybody who's his enemy or is running against him. He had a nickname for them and was funny, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that, uh, he's such a, he's such a strong personality that uh, the media will go and, and find him, even if he's he's not involved in politics at all, because before he was in politics, they were asking him his opinion. I mean, Trump never came to them. They would catch him on the red carpet when he was walking into his building or into his restaurant or doing whatever he was doing. They came to him to see what he had to say because he had all this all this clever stuff.
now. Yeah, he's, he has shaken up the political, both political yeah. side, both sides of the political aisle. He has yeah. definitely shaken up. And uh, he he did have a uh, a nickname for everyone, including Kamala Harris. And his nickname for her was Phony Kamala, which is a very appropriate nickname. It, oh, it, it was a it was a painful, painful interview on Rachel Maddow, where she asks Kamala if she saw the fly on Pence's head, oh. and so Kamala is faking and acting like she saw it in real time as it was happening. But there's no way she could have seen that from 15 feet away. Right. All right. And so then uh, Kamala starts laughing with this manufactured laugh. Because, you know, she does that when she doesn't have an answer, you know. And yeah. it's like, oh, I, I, I think after 30 seconds I had to stop it. And my stomach was turning. Like, oh, God, is this <laughs> this person? Um, but um, one thing I was going to say, it, it shows to... The ignorance of some of the voters and some of the American people, the things that Biden said and Kamala said, and they still got all these votes. I mean, uh, with it being so close, including, remember, Kamala said that people 18 to 24 years old are stupid. Wow. Remember, she said that. That's the college age, uh, you know, young adults. Yes. And we we know there had to be at least five million people in that that range that voted for her and Biden. Mm -hmm. Had to be at least five million. Just looking at the numbers. Yes. But but uh, like hatred can literally blind you. And so the the bright light of hatred that they had may have kind of drowned it out. <laughs> her saying things like that. That you is know? very true. And then, of course, the, the statement with uh, Biden saying, if you don't vote for me, you ain't black. I said before that the biggest problem with that statement is that most black people believe it. Right. <laughs> yes. They're, they're OK with that. They're all right. <laughs> yeah, they certainly do. And then when you tell them about it, like they did when he said it, oh, he's just joking. That's that's just Joe. He just. <laughs> <laughs> But then they'll turn around and you say, well, I'm not voting for him. Well, why can you not vote for him? What's wrong? Well, it's like, okay, Joe. <laughs> I hear Joe coming out of your mouth. So, yep. More divided than we were prior to this election. A lot more divided. Yeah, and people can, people back in the day, in the 80s and 90s, they had their, their, had their own ideals they were either more conservative or more liberal, but there there wasn't the feuding that was going on. Mm -hmm. There weren't people ripping signs out of people's yards right. because of who someone voted for. And many people went back and forth sometimes from one party to the next, you know, voting for the candidate. Uh, like, let's see, like my, my dad, he did not vote for a, uh, Jimmy Carter, he voted for Ford. And then when Reagan ran against Carter, he voted for Carter. Because when my dad was a kid, Reagan was an actor. And he still kind of saw him in that light. Okay. Then 84, after four years of Reagan being in there, and, and my dad being a financial analyst and heavily invested in the stock market, then he voted for Reagan because he saw what he did and how he was turning things around, mm -hmm. you know, but people could get into discussions then. And it didn't, it, it didn't, it was very rare of raised voices and cursing and just, I'm going to put you out of the tribe. You are no longer allowed in the circle of trust. <laughs> right. And, you know, it took me a long time to figure this out, but I analyzed it and figured it out that uncle Tom, what that really does mean is traitor. Mm -hmm. You are a traitor. You are a sell. You are a sellout, which is really, really exaggerated, you know, because what what is the person selling? What are they selling when they're not receiving any money? Like I can see I can see someone getting paid off 
to do something or to endorse something. They don't really believe in it. But they're, they're blacks who vote a Republican and not received uh, any dime, any credit, actually voting in silence. You know, many, many of them, they're the only ones that know they voted Republican. Right. So what are they what are they selling? Oh, you're selling your soul. Now you're a soulless person. You're just a meat puppet floating around. You're just a body, just a warm body. You know, uh, everything, you know, it equates to evil. Like this person, this person is uh, is ungodly. It doesn't have a heart. Or I've heard people say Trump has no good in him, you know. And you you have to you have to have hatred to believe that because everybody has some good in them. It's it's not see they the Democrats they didn't have any issues or anything to counter the issues. So let me attack the person's character and turn them into a villain. You know we're the party that cares. We care about you. We have compassion. Or they'll yell racism and then black folks just freeze up and just oh my gosh and it's all you can't talk to them after somebody yells racism so right even unproven it's almost as if they threw the title out there first and we throw out the label and make it stick and then we'll come up with some reasons why you know we'll think up some reasons why they're supposed to be racist exactly exactly yep. we'll make up something and, and then the press will help us you know, the press will take things out of, con not only will they take things out of context, they will actually say that the person said something that they did not say. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. It's just, just straight up lie on the person. So it's, it's something else where we, where we find out ourselves. It really is. Yeah, Trump, he, he waited until he was 68 years old to become racist. You know, right, <laughs> exactly. Right all, all the time before then, no one, no one ever said that. Yeah. Oprah Winfrey is asking him, "When are you gonna run for president?" You know, yeah. he, he's he's hugging Mike Tyson at the MGM Grand before a fight, yeah. and no, nobody nobody ever said that. And and uh, black people wanted wanted to be him. Mm -hmm. You know, he was in their rap songs. Yeah, Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson. Sitting yeah. on, on both sides of them. Right, I saw that. Yeah. I saw that where uh yeah, Jesse Jackson was speaking and Trump was sitting in the uh in the audience. Yeah, back in uh looked like it was probably in the eighties. Yeah, I think it was. Yes. So the the AOC plus three, which I thought about okay, when Kamala takes over for Biden. She's not going to be able to switch roles with him. She's going to have to get her own vice president. And who will her pick be? Okay. Well, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Go ahead. I'll let you, let you, you care. Know, just it somebody end. who's at least as socialist as she is, you know, yeah. and then started thinking about the AOC plus three and the squad. Right. So yeah. this is this is what it says about uh, about that group. Uh, informal name of four women elected in uh, House of Representatives made up of AOC, Ilhan Omar of Minnesota, Ayanna Presley of Massachusetts, and Rashida Taleb uh, of Michigan. All right. And colloquial use of the word squad arose from the East Coast hip hop culture and describes self chosen group of people that you want to identify with. Um, broken down and used for short, which was the Terror Squad, which was the rap group that Big Pun came from. Uh, Spanish rapper, New York, where uh, he was with the Terror Squad and Cuban links and uh, Cuban and, and Puerto Rican rappers out of, out of New York. So this, this is something the culture has, has created. And uh, these, are, if I'm not mistaken, these were the three women who they were standing there confronting Trump about something and telling him how bad the country is. And he told them, if you don't like it, leave. You <laughs> should leave if you don't want to live here. And then people said that's, that that's racist. And it's not. It's patriotic. Yeah. It's, it's patriot. Patriotic people want to live here. Mm -hmm. And people that hate the country, 
they either got their bags packed or they're on the fence. You know, they they wanna they wanna leave, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's why I, I'm for people uh, visiting, and I think a couple of them were originally born in uh, another country, born in uh, Africa or somewhere in the Middle East. So, hey, you know, w- whatever opposition they're running against here in America is better than them just being a, a, a free citizen or not a free, but, you know, just a just a, uh, a regular citizen who uh, may have not been able to get elected or rise to power as they did in the countries that they came from. It's in. It's interesting, folks, that's what freedom is about. You know, you have this squad, this ignorant squad, a collective IQ of 25, and they're saying all these things. It's like, okay, but you have the freedom to leave. No one is keeping you here. No one says you have to. No, it's, that's what freedom is about. That's what individual liberty is about. So, you know, everybody and all these other people threatened to leave, and if they they'd left, they wouldn't have these issues right now. Um, if you know, and, and the like, every, I'm going to leave if Bush is president. Well, if you'd left when Bush was president, you wouldn't have to worry about what Trump was doing because you wouldn't be here. It's like, right. keep your promise. <laughs> you can like, keep, go. You know? Yeah, right. Yeah. And it's a short-term, short-sighted thinking as if the candidate that they don't like their face is going to be sculpted on Mount Rushmore, and now that's the way it's going to be forever. And <laughs> it's it's not. It's not. And thank God for the people that voted and came out for the for the Congress, the congressional votes yes. for the House and the Senate. And that's that's one other uh, great thing about our country is somebody gets in office who is trying to do something bad for the country or extreme. You have the Senate and the House, and the the best the best way that I can uh, the best example that I can give of checks and balances. We're gonna check you, and we're gonna balance this out <laughs> by by what you do. Everything that you want to, uh, everything that you want to do or that you want to sign into law, you gotta go through us. And I know that uh, I know that the the president has a power of veto. I'm thinking that there's a limited number of vetoes that he can use, or she can use during a term or during a year. You know, I, so that, yeah, I'm you know what I'm saying about that. I don't so that they don't give the president too much power, and he's vetoing everything that Congress kicks back. You know, yeah. you you Definitely. rarely you rarely see that used. Rarely, but I did read about one time when Trump did use it. It was in regards to it was H resolution, House Resolution seventy six, and somehow the resolution was putting more ties onto education funding, such that it would be so regulated that HBCUs would not be able to get funding from the federal government. So, but not Bush. I'm sorry, Trump did veto that piece of legislation and that was um i want to say it was may 2020 he did this so um it definitely has been done like you said i don't know if there is a um limited number of vetoes that they can use or that sort of thing i am not Mm -hmm. sure yeah but yeah like you say it it has been used and i would think used prudently and wisely obviously right right and I, I want to uh, I want to remind people that uh, God is on the throne. Remind Christians and people of faith to know that. And just putting everything in perspective, like uh, God in heaven has a government. Mm-hmm. They have a government. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. They consult and talk about things. They talked about the creation in Genesis. And when when they they said we and what we are going to do, and uh, you know whether whether it's uh, looking at the angels and the cherubim, and uh, how they oversee and and rule and help out and govern, mm-hmm. and also remind Christians, I said now heaven has a gate, and we want to criticize this wall. Just think about that. 
<laughs> that heaven has a gate and the purpose of a gate or a fence is either to keep something out or to keep some in. <laughs> so even heaven and God's not scared of nobody. Right. <laughs> so there, there's nothing, there's nothing uh, wrong with that. Um, and, and just God, uh, God takes care of his people of his people during a recession or during bad times. So we, we want to make sure that we are still living by that. This is thing that will never surprise you or change is the word of God. Uh, and I just want to say, you know, so preposterous for uh, Biden to say, well, Trump divided the country. I'm going to bring it together. I'm going to bring everybody together. Dude, you might reach across the aisle in Washington, D.C. and talk to a few Republicans, but you cannot bring everybody together. (laughs) There's a there's a hundred million people that would never vote for you if they were hanging off a cliff by their pinky. (laughs) All right. So. Jesus Christ couldn't even bring everybody together. That's true. I tell you who who is according to the bible who's going to bring everybody together is the antichrist yes so don't get your hopes up too high about somebody doing that but you know think about that right think about the fact that uh jesus now when he was speaking there were people coming together who uh may have been from samaria or different cities different regions maybe different faiths he spoke to everybody but then when the preaching was over, they went their separate ways. When the persecution started, they, they were nowhere to be found. And so Jesus Christ was perfect. <laughs> and he had uh, Sadducees on the right, Pharisees on the left, the Roman army behind him, and the Sanhedrin in front of him <laughs> saying, crucify him. Okay. And uh, you remember... Uh, you remember when uh, when Jesus squared off with Pontius Pilate and uh, uh, Pilate said, listen, why aren't you answering? Why aren't you saying anything when I'm asking you if you're king of the Jews and if you perform this miracle and that? Is, Don't you understand they're going to kill you? Don't you know that I have the power to kill you? And Jesus looked back at him and he said, Whatever power you have, it, you would not have it unless it was given to you from up above. Right, yep. All right. And Pontius Pilate was like the mayor or the governor of that region, of that area, because they were all under Julius Caesar, who was in Rome, you know, mm-hmm. Rome and, and the, the Roman uh, Empire in Italy. But they had, um, you know, they, they were all over. They traveled and, you know, they were colonizing. Yes. So, uh, and, and then they scared the Sanhedrin, scared Pilate. And they said, well, if you don't side with us, then you're going to be an enemy of Caesar. You won't be an enemy of Caesar, do you? Because there's no way he didn't have an army to go up against them. Uh-huh. So, you know, they, they tried to make it political, uh-huh. which is why you're supposed to separate church and state. Right. <laughs> you're supposed to separate it. Uh, some people want the president to also be the pope. We want a godly person in there, you know, you, you want to look at uh, somebody that that's supposed to be godly or the people thought was godly. Look at, um, oh, what's this guy named Eddie Long, oh, <laughs> Eddie Long of the mega church. All right. Mm-hmm. Eddie Long was a godly man. OK. And then it came out that he was molesting boys and then. A lot of the members left, but at least a thousand still stayed there. They still stayed there knowing that. (laughs) I support you, Pastor. No, I'm not going to support anybody because of who they are. I'm going to support what they stand for, anyone that lines up with my beliefs. Exactly. Exactly. So, Mm -hmm. um, you you know, we had uh, had a surprise this year with COVID-19. I'm just in a play-by-play mode now where you know things can really change in three months or six months and we know what happened with the riots and i don't know about anybody else i don't have a crystal ball i didn't see any of this coming and unfortunately uh the things those things that happened this year it uh it worked against trump it definitely didn't didn't help him 
it was politicized, although he had no control over it. So, you know, it, it is it is what it is. And then everyone, every conservative, every Republican voter has an obligation to be involved just in whatever we can do, whatever we have the power to do. The, the number one thing that we should all be doing is constantly informing ourselves and seeking knowledge and being in tune with what's going on. First, do that. And then when you see something that isn't right or you see the left rising or they're trying to change whatever, then then we can inquire about, well, what can I do? How can I get involved to block this thing or to help protest that thing? Right. And and like you said, it's one is to stay involved. You have to stay on them. Um, yeah. They need to be held accountable and they need to be held accountable daily. Um, to what they say they're going to do, ask them if they did it, what's going to happen if they don't. Um, we have to, because President Trump, he did get a lot of things done. Okay. And there were a lot a lot of people who were out there um, staying involved and that sort of thing. Well, we have to stay involved even more. We have to go to our local meetings. We have to go to our school board meetings. We have to... Um, you know, get with other groups and move forward as groups to say this is what we want done and put pressure on both sides. It's for Republicans and Democrats. We get put pressure on both sides. We can't just put them up there and then um, and then wash our hands and say we're done and come back and try to do something two years later. Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and don't get uh, don't get exhausted or uh, discouraged. It's a, it's an ongoing fight and ongoing thing. The good news is that there are clearly uh, many, many conservatives out there in America. Thank God. Even though people are, are, have been silent Trumpers, whatever, and didn't want to be persecuted. People have been persecuted within their own families. Yes. Yes. You know, and uh, it was, it was really bad. And just just to know, uh, thank God, it's is is more fifty fifty with the conservative liberal than it could could have been seventy thirty in the favor in favor of liberals, and maybe one day it will be. But I, I'm gonna do, and and I hope that other conservatives would do whatever they can uh, to be involved in be involved in voting, and to uh. You know, to just just fight, fight for the Constitution and the preservation of it. Exactly. And with that, what are your final thoughts? You mentioned earlier about you have the freedom to leave. That's a freedom that a lot of people take for granted and may be underrated for those that hate the country. But um, I, I'll end or let you know my final thought be be this on that. Think about the fact. Or I don't know if people uh, remember or know that we went to war with Iraq. And right at the beginning, like there was like a two, three day period where Bush told Hussein, he said, look, if you and your sons leave Baghdad, we won't attack. If y'all just leave. And they chose to stay. They chose to not, not leave and uh, kind of invited us to bring it on. But my point is, the citizens of Baghdad, they wanted to leave because I heard this guy Kyle Kalinsky talking about 200,000 civilians were killed. Right. That's because Saddam Hussein would not let them leave. He wanted to use them as shields, as human shields. So there, there are some countries that you can't leave if you want to. Thank you for listening to Brutally Honest Talk Radio. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover, reach out at BruteHonestRadio at gmail.com. That's B-R-U-T, HonestRadio at gmail.com. And leave a review for us wherever you listen to this podcast and subscribe on YouTube. And remember to hit that notification button so you'll be notified every time we post an episode. And with that, thank you for spending your time with us and we'll talk to you soon. Everybody, take care, and we'll catch you on the next episode.